Good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure to, wel <laughs> to welcome Sheila Pepe, a cross-disciplinary artist who's best known for her large-scale installations and sculptures that address issues of feminism and class. Sheila has exhibited extensively in the US and abroad. A few of her many solo exhibitions have been shown uh, at venues such as Smith College Museum of Art in Northampton, Massachusetts, the Weatherspoon, Weatherspoon Art Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, and the Istanbul International Arts Fair in Turkey. Her work has been part of such important group shows as Hand Made, the Performative Impulse in Art and Craft, shown at the Contemporary Art Museum Houston in Texas, and Artistarium in Tbilisi, Georgia, and the very first Greater New York show at uh, PS1 MoMA in 2000. Sheila has received awards and held residencies at organizations such as the Joan Mitchell Center and the Lower East Side Print Shop, among many others. Sheila received a BFA from uh, Mass Art in 1983 and an MFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, also known as the Museum School, in 1995. She's been an educator at Brandeis University, Bard, RISD, VCU, Williams, Skowhegan, and was assistant chair of fine arts at Pratt until recently. We are so happy to now have Sheila on faculty with us here at SVA. Please join me in welcoming Sheila Pepe. Thank you. Hello. So it's a pleasure to be here and to start off the new year with all of you. And here we go. So uh, these are the Pepe's uh, about 19, before 1959, which is the, the uh, year that I was born. And um, you know, I'm going to tell you a lot of autobiographical information, but I want to underscore the fact that I'm reading this stuff for the cultural artifacts and um, uh, kind of cultural archive of pieces of things that they wore, that, uh, that I might have seen as a child. Uh, I know those shoes from my grandmother. I used to like play around them. So the, the autobiographical pieces are not really meant to be um, incredibly uh, subjective, rather they are the things that I can find in a culture outside of my own individual experience that you may, depending on how old you are or how much Nick at Night you've watched or where you go on the internet, um, you may or may not have known, but uh, you'll see that they are generational, um, uh, a kind of intergenerational factoids and they, they are pieces of culture that, that remain resonant for me. So, um, you know, the interesting thing about this photograph, apart from the baggy suits, um, is the family resemblance. I mean, apart from uh, the suits and the clothing and the shoes, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute, um, there is ultimately that thing that happens to a person when they recognize a real, um, genetic feature right, of, of their own that they can identify as uh, a regional part of Italy, like being in Piemonte and having somebody at the, at the, uh, at the uh, Pistoletto Foundation and have somebody stare at me very intently and say in Italian, where are you from? Which I don't understand, or I do now, but I, wouldn't, I didn't then and realize that he has recognized something in my features that another Italian would recognize as a regional um, look. Um, then I look into his eyes and realize, oh, he has that ba weird baggy thing under his eyes too. He's probably from the South as well. So there's a strange thing that is both genetic and cultural that I think is kind of fascinating. And for all of us that are doing DNA, DNA tests now, there's some, some search for further verification of, of um, some kind of sense of identity. The thing that I love about this uh, photograph is that I, and probably somebody else, can tell that uh, Grandma Rose, who's in the middle, um, 
is flanked by her two daughters, Annie to her right, who lives in New Jersey all year long, and um, no, Mary to her right, who lives in New Jersey or lived in New Jersey all year long, and um, Annie to her left, who lived in Florida all year long. And from the shoe equation, you can tell that Grandma Rose spent half the year in New Jersey and the other half the year in Florida. I um, was brought up in a very Italian, uh, uh, I'm second generation Southern Italian American, way liberal um, Roman Catholic church. This was one of the um, stained glass windows in my church. It was like a really big deal. It was a Second Vatican Council design church. We could have a whole lecture on Second Vatican Council architecture in the United States, um, but I won't subject you to that. Um, just know that I went to mass every Saturday or every Sunday until the age of 17, which in New Jersey is the driving age at which time you can say, oh yeah, Ma, I went to mass, um, and go to the diner, which is also a New Jersey phenomenon, and drink coffee and smoke cigarettes all morning long. Um, I grew up in a family business, which actually, for those of the students that I might be working with, you should know that I have a very um, uh, pretty intense work ethic issue. Um, I, I like work. I, uh, I like to do things that involve work and involve work that is, as you will see, ephemeral in some way. I think. Um, the quality of the labor has, uh, could mean many things, many different things in, in terms of the quality of the output, uh, the, as, as we say, the outcomes now of our labor. Um, some of the cultural events from my childhood included going to the um, World's Fair when I was a child. I um, do vaguely remember seeing the Pieta, but I mostly remember hiding my face in my mother's skirt as we rode along the moving sidewalk, my first time on a moving sidewalk, and that it was dark. I mean, it was like beauty, the Pieta was beauty lit. What I now, in retrospect, find interesting is all of, at the World's Fair, which doesn't really exist anymore, there are pavilions from every country around the world. My parents decided to go to the Vatican's pavilion. So that's their idea of like the foreign country they wanted to visit first. Like, it, it's a good indication of the size of the world that I lived in. Happily, I grew up in North Jersey, which meant that um, in the 60s and mostly in the 70s, we were taken as school children on buses into New York to go to the major museums to go to rehearsals of, um, of uh, the Metropolitan Opera. So we went to MoMA, the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Opera House. I saw Peter, I heard and saw Peter and the Wolf conducted by Bernstein. As a child, there were a lot of screaming children. When we went to the Metropolitan Opera, we were in the family circle where the nosebleeds were, but we didn't really care because I thought the coolest thing was, was they showed you the changing of the sets with, like in full light during that happened. So you kind of got a sense of art being made. Um, this uh, Guernica was one of my favorite early things to see, partly because there was um, a game I would play with the guards, which was how close could you get to Guernica without getting in trouble, um, which was pretty close, but, um, in a very uh, visceral way, I sort of understood that they was, these were kind of like big cartoons um, and people were upset. That's what I got. I didn't know what Guernica was. Guernica was the name of a painting. That was it. Um, I love and loved and have loved TV. I think every generation has uh, it's, uh, it's medium. Many, for many of you, the medium is, um, is the web, is the internet, is whatever, email, everything that pertains to that. My mother's generation, it was the radio. The radio would be on all of the time as she did her work throughout the house. 
my thing was the TV. I could have the TV on. I could still have the TV on. Um, although I don't really li watch TV now, I stream TV. So it's, it's, it's disturbing when you can't just you know, turn the thing on for free and just have the signal going all of the time. But as you can see, I like the kind of high color um, boys, you know, together in a getting things done. I like the, the, I like a costume drama, as you can see. Um, this is the first Wild West. I also like a wait until next week. Um, the old Batman, you had to come, re, you had to come back, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, this might be an early signal that I'm going to be, or that I am a gay child. I also, I, I took the slide out, but because most people are like, who's that? But um, I had a child, like, love, ro I had a huge romance with Judy Gar Garland when I was a child, which is a sure sign that I was like a gay boy as a child. Um, some of you might not understand that. I will explain it later. Or if you see Tommy Lanigan Schmidt around, ask him about Judy and, okay. I also, um, I went to a public grammar school because in my parents' world, they wanted us to know that there were other people in the world besides Catholics. That was nice. And then Catholic co-ed high, high school and all women's Catholic college for the first time where I was, um, where I was an art major. And I have to say very happily studied the liberal arts from Dominican nuns who could tell you a few things about rigor. Um, so I think without that initial kind of both collegiate experience, but also the idea of, of study for study's sake and going to college during a time when you went to learn about the world and uh, in general, and you went to learn how to learn um, and how to be a citizen. I mean, that was what we thought we were doing when we went away to college. Um, I, th I think I hold those, uh, I, I hold that dear just about living, that, that being even an uh, autodidact about anything, um, and not particularly art, but whatever you're curious about, is a very important part of my uh, kind of world tools and something I encourage uh, when teaching, oh, when it's really nice to be able to talk about things that are not um, about real estate sales or the latest gossip in the art world, because that can get boring after a while. So when I left Albertus, I went to uh, Massachusetts College of Art, and because of my primary experience was in making things out of clay, I joined the ceramics department as a transfer student. And at that time, I think basically what I did was made my own post back before there was a post back kind of program. So uh, they, they don't let you do this anymore, like double dip on the credits. So I transferred credits and then got a BFA in ceramics. When I went to art school, um, I made things for my imagination. I mean, I, I didn't, there was no critical I just made stuff. I could kind of dream it on the way to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I would see things. And I was also like watching a lot of uh, John Waters movies. And I, I was a huge fan of the 32, 1932-33 movie Freaks. There was a double feature at Calvin, at, at uh, Coolidge Corner Cinema. And they would play all these crazy old pictures and so that I was attracted to um, a sense of otherness and this is right before the Catholic girl comes out as a lesbian. So I'm like, I'm like, John Waters, take me somewhere, I don't know where, to the poop eating side of the world. And it, you know, like I was like, wow, this is great. And then, um, and you can see, I did have some politics. I had some early feminist politics. You can see in the foreground, these are my little generals with their little cod pieces. And, um, but it was mostly a very kind of surreal and imaginative world. When I left, uh, you know, so then I really, I came out and then I was really like, whoa, patriarchy's a bummer. And now I'm really a feminist. Uh, 
And so by the time I left, I was making sort of meta, making material and um, discipline metaphors. So, you know, in, when you study a discipline that's also a medium, like ceramics, you study how to use both the traditional forms of the medium and also um, the material language of that medium as a way to make meaning. So, of course, my women bricks were triangular um, in a very essentialist sense of, you know, the, the pubic mons, they're inverted, of course, because they have to have their wheels underneath. So this idea of women are bricks, women build, women are mobile, um, perhaps you would say diasporic now, but that um, women are without uh, uh, a nation was kind of the thought at the time. Actually, women are without a nation. Um, and then in the background, you can see I made these kind of drawings that layered up um, tracing paper drawings of like little uh, diagrams of m movement and these things moving around. I, I love this piece and I, I love showing it because when I see this thing about small, multiple, craft-oriented objects set into a domestic setting, um, this idea of, of um, demarking a space through materials and um, and uh, trying to make a, a, a cultural frame about a group of people who don't really have a cultural frame unto themselves. I can see my early, I can see my work now in terms of these early kind of moving into uh, a, a, a methodology, if you will. Um, so, you know, Art school was over, and I don't know how many of you have ever had this feeling. It's like, great, I'm really good at being an art student, and now what do I do? So, of course, Dad offered that I come back to New Jersey, and he said, Sheil, we'll open a deli together or a restaurant, and, you know, I'll set you up. This was a tradition in his family. His dad had, was a shoe, uh, had a shoe repair shop, actually a few in Manhattan, um, in Brooklyn, in Jersey, and... Uh, and the tradition was that the father sets the son, in this case, the daughter. My father was a liberal. He let his daughters go to college. Um, set you up in a shop, and then you work together. And when the dad retires from that business, it's your business. And I said, Dad, you know, I, I don't want to be in that business. I went to college and went to art school. I'm going to be an artist. Um, and, uh, you know, he's like, OK, whatever you want. He was, he was, you know, he was uh, of a particular World War II generation. You only have to do two things in life, die and pay taxes. It sounds really exciting. Um, so, of course, what did I do? I worked in a lesbian separatist restaurant, not one that I owned, but one that I was invested in. So, um, after I got out of mass art, and I was extremely angry, not only at patriarchy in general, but... Um, but the art world as a patriarchal institution, ceramics world in particular, because they were doing all that bad shit to Mother Earth. They were taking stuff out of her belly, and you know it was like a bona fide essentialist. Um, and they were just, there was just a lot of like mastery of the material boy vibe around ceramics that I think we've worked ourselves our way out of in the last whatever, 30-some years. Um, and you can still find it in pockets of, of any craft society. Um, but I just didn't like that mastery thing. It's like everything had to have, yeah, like a little funky. Anyway, we had an amazing time at Beatles Lunch. It was a place, um, you know, that, that got uh, voted Boston's best punk restaurant. And when they called to tell the owner, who eventually would become my partner, she said, we're not a, an effing um, punk rock restaurant. We're a lesbian separatist restaurant, and hung up the phone and like declined, declined the award. There was always this thing, and I don't know if you can imagine it, uh, but there was always this issue of being misrecognized, people not knowing who you were. This is before Ellen. This is 
This is before uh, when it was just very difficult for lesbians to be vi visible in any particular way. Um, as, as Dyke Action Machine has said, um, the question is, are you two sisters? So it's not so anymore. And in the past 10 to 15 years, the changes has been, have been exponential. But if you can imagine, as any 20-year-old artist probably thinks, I am not being seen, you could, uh, you know, how many people kind of feel like, OK, I'm doing great work, but I'm not being seen, honestly? We've got an honest person down here. Yeah, a couple of fans. Like, the desire to be seen in the proper context in the right way. Um, well, that's like your average lesbian was like, look, I, I am not the girl next door. Um, and so we lived in a kind of coded universe that maybe doesn't exist anymore. Um, I just want to say also about the, these images, these are also an odd mediation of image. They were originally slides that at that time we would take our slides to the copy store and have them scanned and printed as color Xeroxes. So these are scans of old deteriorated color Xeroxes. They have a very cool kind of like tacky surface. It's, I, it, it, when you realize it's something that was at the time, it's how you'll feel about your jump drives in about 20 years, I'm guessing. So this was a place for women workers to do exactly what they wanted to do. We played the music as loud as we want. We played whatever we want. You could stop working and go light a cigarette. You could smoke in the restaurant at the time for a cute girl if you wanted to. It was really um, our place. And just the desire was to feel liberated in a way that we could work in a place that w belonged to us. The workplace belonged to us. We, we were, um, we weren't the bosses, but we were kind of the bosses of ourselves. There's Hollandaise instruction. Okay, watch the elbow. Okay, there's the elbow, probably the same t-shirt. Um, at that time, after ceramics, I was a kind of a fire nut. I, when I was at MassArt, I would go leave the kilns, which I was firing all the time, and go over and help in glass. And so then I went up to Haystack and studied uh, patterned weld Damascus steel. And uh, more fire was, was better than less firing. And so, you know, I was still trying to pursue a way to work that was, um, as any young artist, felt meaningful. Um, and still without any really understanding of the context of how one lived in the world as an artist. And so what happened eventually is that I, um, I stopped, I kind of swore off the art world. I stopped making work. I made posters and signs like this for, I made stuff for friends. We, we were, I guess, what we now call uh, creative creatives or, um, or we made political art or, I mean, I honestly thought I was not making art and I was purposely not making art. I was saying, I'm not part of that world. Um, we just all used whatever we had to do whatever we needed to do. And um, from about 84 to 89, no art. Um, we did hang out with some really interesting women, women older than ourselves. One of them was Mary Daly, who is, um, she's probably not very well known anymore here. She was a professor at Boston College who um, was uh, kind of called up for not wanting any men students in her women's studies class. She would tutor them separately, but she wanted to create women-only spaces so that women could have all of the agency in the classroom. Um, I think probably her most interesting book, um, right, because she's a former Catholic teaching like her first book is Beyond God the Father. She's a theologian, right? Her probably most famous book is called Gynecology. And so she was an icon of separatist thinking. And she was always, because I was in Massachusetts and she taught in Boston, she was always in this kind of circle of speakers that we would travel around listening to. 
um, she had a posse and we were kind of at the edges of that posse, but we were part of it. Because it's a college town, there were many people who were coming up during that era. Um, Andrea Dworkin was another one who, you know, kind of blew my mind because she was talking about rape um, in very analytical terms, but she was also, she was doing feminism and class and um, a kind of looking at also uh, sex workers and sex as uh, a kind of um, uh, bondage for women um, and not, not the fun kind. Actually, it was before the culture wars. So I don't know if and Andrea Dworkin would think that bondage was a fun thing. It was, it's interesting to look back now, and especially that this was happening, these dialogues were happening very forcefully in, in New England. There's a very American, very Puritan streak to a lot of the work. And we were going to Beatles lunch all day long. And my work ended up translating into things like, I'm going to make a useful way to keep the, um, the uh, Beatles lunch menus off of the table so they don't keep sliding to the floor. And, you know, making the salt and pepper shakers turn over. Uh, this was my solution. It didn't work. But you can see I like stringing things up. You know, I, I, I didn't mean it as anything else than a utilitarian thing. Um, so, you know, the truth of it was that none of us, we would have all been happy going to lectures all the time and, you know, having sing-alongs that we would have parties at the end of the night or we would do a lot of crazy things, poetry readings. Um, we wanted to be free. I mean, nobody wanted to really have a job, really. That's why we wanted to have a job that was really easy and ours. And uh, many, some of us wanted to be artists. Some of us wanted to just go on and do other things. Some people became librarians, others filmmakers. Uh, there's a musician in the group. Uh, there's a florist who's now out in, in uh, New Mexico, a uh, cabinet maker. So, People left, the place got sold to a poor guy who didn't know why the, the day he took over the restaurant, nobody showed up because there was this coded behavior of all the lesbians showing up there. And we moved out to Western Mass where we furthered this idea of, of going to women's land. So this was a stop along the highway back to the land which I have to say I failed at. I, I found out that I am from New Jersey and I'm never going to live with a composting toilet, okay? That's just <laughs> never going to happen. That's not part of my idea of feeling free. In fact, um, what I learned, except for these amazing women, Katie Van Doors, also known as Axe Maker to the Queen, who made all of those, she's a silversmith, um, Diana Davies, who's still living out in Western Mass, who was a photographer for Look and Life um, during the late 50s and early 60s, and was known to be wearing like a suit on the plane with the, all the boy photographers on her way to Biafra, um, so that she had some phot photographs. You know, she lost that career because she would go back to the guys and say, I don't want to take any more pictures of starving children. I want to take pictures of the healthy ones. They're like, yeah, OK, Davies, you're out. Um, but she was that era when um, I, you know, I found out we were young. We thought they were lesbians. And they weren't lesbians. They were tough gals who liked any strong woman. And so they attracted a lot of lesbians. And we were just pretty sure Katie was a lesbian. Uh, because she had a lover for a while that we were really aware of. Um, but it's this, this interesting thing about language where there's a name for you and you use it and you want to use it and then there's a name that doesn't get used and it's fine that way. This kind of issue of naming and knowing and being seen and not being seen became a kind of issue for me over time. But during these years, I, I learned uh, that I didn't want to be dogmatic. I didn't want to be a dogmatic Catholic, and I didn't want to be a dogmatic separatist. That things were complicated. Uh, Audre Lorde, who was also somebody that we would go listen to speak, provided the most insightful 
we, God's deconstruction of her relationship with Mary Daly was very encumbered by Daly's racism and inability to say that uh, being a woman alone wasn't everything. So, right, this is the problem of a certain era of white, um, of white feminists coming from a particular place and not being able to see anything beyond that experience. And so, although, you know, Lord was somebody who allowed for multiple identities. She called herself a warrior poet. She called herself a black lesbian mother. She was the first person that really suggested that we have multiple identities all functioning. And she was the first person who explained to me as a person, but then later I would hear it as an artist, that the first thing is you learn the master's tools. And this as, a, as an aspect of both survival, but as an aspect of infiltrating an art world that I was suspect of, that that kind of adaptation would become very meaningful and very powerful. So in time, you know, Mary Daly and her wonderful double acts um, appropriated from the Isle of Lesbos, I know, okay, not everybody on Lesbos is, we now know they might be a refugee, thank you very much, <laughs> but they might not all be lesbians. Um, I sort of gave Mary Daly the ax in, in a certain way, and I did what you're not supposed to do, is go work for the patriarchy. I missed art. I missed being around art. The conversations about art were horrible because you couldn't reference anything that was part of the canon because it was all part of patriarchy. So we were kind of made to look at really bad illustrations, to, like things that were just not informed by history at large. So what did I do? I went back and worked for a small museum, the Smith College Museum of Art, and um, met Nancy Spiro among a, a bunch of other really wonderful artists and people and um, had a relationship with objects and artists and curators and conservators in, that just opened up the, the world of how art functions as a, an expanded field. Like suddenly I could open the New York Times and understand why all these weird ads were in the same place where there was like a, 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 an antique next to a piece of modern art. Like it just didn't compute. Why, uh, and, and, and this may sound strange to you, but remember this is a world where there were like four TV channels. Like this is where my head has been born, in a place where there are four, maybe six on a good day, TV channels. So, so the, the evolution of my consciousness is always being fed by my awareness of art in this tiny bubble. And I began to, uh, I worked at, so I worked in museums, and I did consider other careers in, in, a, in, a, in an effort to be practical, but, um, but I couldn't do it, because I saw too many people who were former painters or were former sculptors who were not particularly happy in their work, and who didn't really like, some of them really didn't like living artists, which is, was upsetting. Um, so I started making work again, and I made work beginning with my small community and with a certain amount of wordplay. So, um, so these little figuratives, these little figures, I went all the way back to the figure and they, these dolls are about maybe six inches, five inches. Um, I showed them in Northampton and said, okay, what is, now I don't know what I'm doing and applied to graduate school and in the fall of 92, went back, left the, left the hill town, left the um, happy valley of, of Western Mass and uh, went to the museum school. So that's a particularly long backstory, but I think it, it's, it sets up a lot of the, um, the cultural references and the, the kind of emerging, emerging from kind of layers of claustrophobia into looking at what the problem is. Um, so, so I want to take you back to the first moment you saw this image and try to, um, 
do that thing that you can do with it, flip back and forth, right? Where you're like, maybe you got a name for it, maybe you don't. Maybe you just say old young, or you say, you know, babushka dancing girl, like, like maid and crone. Can you see it? You all see it? You know how to, you guys know how to do this picture? Anybody not? It's possible. Okay. The thing I love about these things is that I could name what they are. I could get very specific. Like, I know what kind of maid that is. That's like a, a kind of trick uh, uh, um, Parisian um, uh, dancing girl, turn of the century, right, with the feather and the thing. Or maybe it's from the Wild West and she's the American version of the Can Can Girl. I don't know. And then the other, the crone, she's got like a babushka, she's got, you know, she's got a kerchief on and she's in, she's got her pointy nose down there and those lips and like she's in that uh, hairy coat or maybe something with a fur collar from the 30s. But I can go there. I can like fill out that picture with more detail. But the thing that I love the best is that weird moment where you get your eyes and your mind to kind of like mash the whole thing up so you can flip from one to the other. Because if you hold on too tight to either one of them, you can't transition. You gotta go somewhere like seriously abstract. Like uh, I, I go between the jawbone and the, and the lips because that's the thing that turns it from one kind of face into another. I go in there and kind of like rearrange things. And then the language sets in again. So this idea of um, having something that means more than one thing, right? That we have uh, these opposites, but then the opposites have some other kind of ground that, that makes a sound even between them. And so what, what it, my project, as I entered, so some of this stuff is from, this is from my studio before I entered um, the museum school. I did it, I had no idea what it was, but it was like, I got something. I don't know what it is, but I know this is something. Make a little, this is my ADD making, you know, a little bit of something, plaster and a wire and a this, and then there's a box of things that I make other things out of, and then they become other things, and then shine a light. And I don't know what's happening. I pick the pencil up out and I make a drawing on the wall, and now I'm like, okay, that's a piece of something. In time, what I realize is that many things are happening. I'm, my own education, my self-education is I am demonstrating this dichotomy that, I, that, that um, I was often faced with. You're either an abstract artist or you're a representational artist, and don't mess with Mr. In-Between. Like, don't go, like, that's it. You're either on this side or you're on this side. You're either this or you're that. You're either gay or you're straight. You're either Italian or you're American. You either go to church or you don't. Like these constant like Western dichotomies that just didn't make any sense. I knew that there was another space. I was experiencing that other space on a daily basis. And although we had a name for it, we called it being a dyke, it was not palpable anywhere, and the slipperiness was not palpable. I mean, it didn't require being a dyke. It just required being a person that understood the virtue of, of um, the slipperiness of meaning. So the project became a kind of naming game without words. So make a small thing out of in, in a kind of automatic gesture of assemblage, make a small light, focus it, see the abstract shadow, draw a picture in the shadow. And at the end, call them doppelgangers because you see uh, a, this equation of two dissimilar things um, tied be, uh, together be, by the, the kind of force, the phenomena of light and shadow. Um, so this idea of holding these shared differences together, and there's one in full light, became a real cornerstone to how I see not just the, wor the world, I see the world this way, but also um, 
see my own work, and that accumulating sets of differences and, um, and this kind of meander of uh, looking at the spaces between uh, similar things became very important. And so um, the other part of it was that to focus on the experiential nature of work that has um, a concrete handmade identity, things made out of things, um, that does not look, um, it, it, you know, doesn't look badly upon ready-mades and other kinds of found and ridiculous things or cartoons or like there are no rules about who's in or out um, but there are more and more inclusions and so because of that the work for several years was completely ephemeral meaning it was as Judy Pfaff used to tell me, it's like a rock, it's like a rock concert. You've heard the song before, but you were there, if you were there, you heard that version of it. If you weren't there, you didn't. It's just simple. So the work was up, it did its thing, you unplugged it from the great infrastructure of, of the like megaverse of electricity, um, and, uh, and you took it, you paint, repainted the wall that the work is contingent upon, you retake the objects and cannibalize them for new projects. And so for, for many years I did that. And, and, uh, and I, I understood it, I, I understood it as just a strategy, a kind of defiant strategy of being in and out at the same time. Um, and in 1997, a colleague asked, how, how can you bear to do that? Like destroy your work over and over again? Um, because but even by 97, I had made a lot of work. And um, I said, uh, you know, I, um, I was perfectly prepared for it. Uh, I am like the, for many reasons, for art reasons, I am like the bastard child of Judy Chicago, um, the maker of, of um, iconography in the most populist way, and of Eva Hesse, who understood contingencies in a way that Chicago could never be interested in. I mean, she spent years finding a home for the dinner party before it got to the Sackler Center. The sense of history through the object was, is, probably still a very important part of, of uh, Chicago's work and insertion into the quote canon. Um, this idea of contingency made sense to me through Eva Hess's work, um, but it also just made sense to me as a person um, that my identity was still contingent on being seen as the middle of a space between two opposites or uh, being a girl um, whose, whose early um, childhood was uh, being taught that, uh, that you are kind of contingent upon the male, you are the rib of Adam. Um, so these kind of activities, uh, this kind of, this issue of contingency and then this issue of um, uh, kind of holding these parts that I want to equalize together became very important. So what I can do to, to know my work, because I like this kind of circuitous holding of different parts together, is that I describe my work to myself. And, and I am doing this um, also in the context of teaching here in terms of talking about what critique is. And I think the most powerful part of critique is the description. And the description you share with each other and the description you give to yourself. When you, um, when I uh, uh, leave the personal narrative away uh, on the side, I then describe these things as I understand them to be things. So here we go. So I describe, an object in a drawing that are contingent, 
concrete and ephemeral, abstract and representational, and a picture. An object that is a drawing, a picture, a process, and is ephemeral. A domestic craft process that made an abstract picture that is a window treatment, that is a room divide. Drawings that are objects. Contingent objects that are drawings made with light and shadow. Drawings that are works on paper. Drawings that are photographs. Photographs that are painterly, which are drawings that are dynamic all over compositions. Contingent drawings that are objects. Objects that are automatically made from ready-mades. Objects that are automatically made, that are handmade, that identify a family resemblance and create a dynamic field composition. Objects that identify a family resemblance, that are handmade and cast from ready-mades. Objects that include a ready-made, cast from ready-mades, and stand alone. Object made using a domestic craft to make a drawing that is a, an ephemeral object that casts shadows to make drawings. Object made from ready-mades that is a drawing that is a dynamic all over field composition made using a domestic craft, made by cannibalizing old work, cutting it apart, and putting it back together. A drawing that is a work on paper, which is made by cannibalizing old work, cutting it apart, and putting it back together. A drawing that is a work on paper, which is made by cannibalizing old work, cutting it apart, and putting it back together. That is a dynamic field composition that has a strong referent. The referent, the, the trestle over the Ninth Street Bridge at, uh, over the Gowanus Canal. An object that is made by crocheting shoelaces and rubber bands. An object that is made by knotting rubber bands that is a room divide and a drawing. Rubber bands, picture, painting, meatballs, video, picture, painting, plaster, shoelace. So now you see this kind of reiteration of types of things that are in relationship to each other, that share definitions and descriptions, that don't share definitions and descriptions. And the interesting thing about this is that this is no longer at all unusual to you, because this is the world that we live in now. We live in a world that has many sets of minor and major relationships that, based on a search or a set of kind of connectors, um, overlap or don't. Um, maybe that was true five years ago, or maybe that was a more truthful statement ten years ago. It really has to do with your own tolerances and your own use of the internet. Um, what I see more and more in this kind of flattened layer of being able to use, for example, my work from different eras and ages and being able to make an argument that is completely ahistorical to the sequence of my making, right, in order to see you how I think about my work. This is a world that we live in in terms of work in general, in terms of reference in general. It's all laid out as this kind of hyper-extended supersurface of possibilities. There was a moment a few years ago when I thought maybe we were going deep instead of wide, but I see more and more through uh, kind of the, the, the um, social media in particular and maybe other ways that um, junctures of, of um, like search engines that will tell you, well, chopping is probably the thing Shopping and looking and going to the library are the two things that we could talk about for hours that are so radically different, it would blow your mind if you knew the difference. Um, not because I don't think you go and shop or go and look in the library, but that thing, that possibility is there always. And what I see 
are these things? We, I believe, are more balkanized than ever. We are less tolerant of difference, even though we see more of it. We are tolerant of it online, but perhaps not in person, right? To have a aesthetic dialogue, a difference, argument is very difficult to do without things getting very emotional. And I would say for a good 20 years, we worked very hard at bringing those things in line where people's feelings were no longer being hurt. You were talking about the work, not the person. The art world aside, the problem when we live in, a, in the ahistorical world is that reference can be colonized by anyone for any reason. So I believe that historical historicity is important. Um, history counts, uh, and, um, and I'll just say it this way. So chronological history still is important, whether you like it or not. And that's the interesting thing. You can not like the history that's been written. For a long time, that's what artists did. They said, I don't like that history. I'm going to change that history. I personally am going to insert myself in history and personally try to change that history of art and maybe even of the world. That's hubris, yes, I know. That's who we are, OK? That's kind of what I think it's what we do. Um, so do I love Jackson Pollock? Nah. Do I love his work? Yeah, it's hard to say it, but I adore his work. I think he was a putz. I mean, I don't, I don't like the man, right? Uh, but, uh, but whatever, OK? He made that stuff, and I am imprinted with it at a very early age. So what's important to me is this. This is where my work comes from. This is lesbian decor circa 1984 when Sonia Johnson was running for president for the Green Party. That Wicca web thing with the labyrinths, the double acts, that's how lesbian separatists decorated our parties. And it was not part of patriarchy. It was like Wicca-ish. It was not part of the canon. So what am I doing? I'm taking this plus this and referencing this. And so at a certain moment when my work is talked about in terms of, you know, which I loved being in the show, the photogenic, and talked about as being a kind of conceptual device, the ephemerality made it a very particular kind of heady thing, photography, video, I gave up video, I gave up anything photo-based. And I was like, OK, guys, I'm going to see, I'm going to test the limits of taste, of acceptability. And at a time when most young women sculptors were referencing men as the precursors of their work, when I knew damn well a lot of the precursors were women, I decided to go back and be a bridge. And so in 2001, I took the work into institutionalized spaces and began thinking of it as infiltrating space with handcraft, um, with a kind of formalism for formalism's sake, to say, yes, I'm a formalist, I think that's a good thing. I aspire to being a formalist, because in a class sensibility, you are not going to take my formalist like aspirations away from me just at the moment when I feel like I have, a, I have access to that dialogue. Um, formalism is never without meaning. It's always imbued with the meaning of its making and the politics of its making and its materials. So this idea of camping out in a, in a, in a white box, sometimes making these huge drawings that I think are like scribbles in space, um, sometimes referencing places with language, um, uh, with materials, lining the walls with shoelaces and black rubber and calling it hot lesbian formalism. This is all part of the equation. It's in the entire performance of it, right? Because it goes up, it's named, it comes down. 
And this idea of making tents and places for classes to take the space over and do other things, to crochet either urban fences is what I'm thinking about, or you could also look at it at ripped lingerie, that's fine too. Um, to infil uh, infiltrate spaces like with the materiality of color, um, of uh, a kind of optical immersion, of that kind of phen the phenomena of being there, and really saying to, to a language base, you know, I, I think I, you know, I love language too, but to a way of making work that's primarily language based, if you put the language away for a minute, all of the other sensory capacities that we have before and after language still function really well. So it's like keeping all of those muscles working all the time because for me being an artist isn't, isn't segregating a certain set of skills away from a certain set of skills or an agenda away from another agenda. It's, it's amplifying these um, capacities through, through repetition. So, you know, this idea of, of um, making, you know, feminizing the grid of Midtown with tool. Very simple act and also uh, the aspiration to make a painting when, you know, you just can't. Finding, uh, finding stuff instead of making stuff. And also the context of the exhibition. This is for a group I exhibition called Radical Lace and Subversive Knitting. And everybody was making everything but the traditional like wall hanging. And I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna make like wall hanging for the old, what we used to call craft museum, now called the Museum of Art and Design. Art and Design. Museum of, yeah, MAD. It's like that was the American Craft Museum. Why did you have to change its name? Were you ashamed of the name? Um, there's no reason to be ashamed of making a wall hanging. It's cool. So like the classing of objects is important to me. How one lives in the space um, is important to me. And I continue now to make these things, but no longer um, ask the objects to be ephemeral. I've realized after a number of years that making oneself, one's work invisible by destroying it yourself is not a very good plan for, uh, for a feminist who wishes to be part of uh, a larger dialogue. So, you know, erasure, it was, it was, it was a contextual move uh, in terms of priorities of people before objects. Um, but the, the context has changed and so that's no longer important. So finally, there, there are a couple of things. There are then also projects where I work with others, uh, this with Ball Nogus, um, kind of finalizing the design and fabricating their seating, this kind of joy of making things that people use instead of, right? It's that, the thing at Beatles Lunch that I couldn't figure out, well I had the, I had the, the structure of the architects to hang my projects on, and then others in, in, in a kind of gesture of losing control. Um, another in terms of what do you do when you bring that domestic act back into a public yet domestic space. And this is where I begin the Common Sense series where I make the formal uh, design and then literally a design in space. But I make it in such a way that it could be easily unraveled by all of the participants. And it's, it, folks are encouraged to use the art as raw material, take away the material either in balls. Uh, here they did a lot of um, knitting and crocheting lessons. In uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, the, um, the, the women of the craft collective there just really liked the materials that I brought because they were natural materials. They were materials that were very expensive there or very difficult to get your hands on. So they were just, they made this gesture over and over again and I was like, I'm with you, okay. You got it, it's all yours. So it's also doing this repeatedly in different places, in different countries, like those, that couple right there that's on the, <laughs> that's on the date and the guys like 
crocheting or something, love them. It's like, who knew they were so cool with, you know, feminized um, or not so much feminized uh, craft items. And then doing it as a kind of performative, um, I guess one might call social something, social sculpture. For me, each new work is an experiment to see how it functions in the context of making. Uh, some better than others. You know, the goal, this, this, at CAM, this is a very formal construction, and then they had cocktails and crochet, and uh, the, the, the desire is to have it completely naked um, when it's done, and I think the only place that happened was in Tbilisi, Georgia. And this idea of taking this object called space, I think of it as a thing that is very uh, uh, open-ended, and beginning to think of it as place. So working with others, then with my friend Diana Puntar, a participant, making a space for our friends to do stuff in, scout, performing, uh, uh, designers coming and doing dressing parlor, uh, cupcakes, napkin dresses, later it was shots, queer modern dance, the space, and then these things rolling into being asked to make spaces, this the research sec station and the Shenzhen Biennial. So I must say that um, working as well with, at Pratt with designers and having a really strong conversation with the architecture people and the in interiors people who are generally women architects who are like, yeah, we're working from the wall to your skin and that's our radical space, makes a lot of sense to me. So in the past few years, I've had the opportunity for several solo shows, and almost all of them I've made into kind of group operations. So making spaces to look at paintings, for example. My friend Julie Ryan's paintings, Paola Ferrario's phot photographs, Fabio Lomancelli's photographs. This is somebody who's uh, from Mexico City, but she made these abstract, that little abstract photograph there, all using natural light um, and a large format camera, something that is, it, you know, looks like it could be done easily in, in different ways. Um, and thinking of it as a kind of space that I would want to look at from one of, from underneath one of my um, tent table, you know, like uh, TV tray tent table things some people make when they were kids. I don't know, I did. Fort, so you, where I watch TV from, I wanted to look at Fabio's photograph from there. And so the last project that I did, um, this section of it is, is the section of it that I installed the kind of main show, if you will, or was to be, was called uh, Put Me Down Gently, A Cooler Place. These were uh, seating arrangements with plug-ins so you could come and take your laptop and hang out in air conditioning in Houston for the summer if you didn't have air conditioning. But the other kind of um, embed, not only were they people who had events here or had meetings here or took their breaks here in the afternoon from work or something, but the other idea that was that the work would be opened up and uh, my young friend Sandra Perry would be able to perform in it. And then the performance became a little bit more light leak and space taking than uh, a performance in the space. And then the show turned into Sheila Pepe um, chooses Sandra Perry, uh, a, a, a cooler place, and this portion which is called I Can't Do That. So this idea of um, setting up relationships between and among ourselves that have a hinge. This was really not a collaboration. It was the color blue and um, certain material use and sense of objecthood um, and a very brief description of not wanting to know or share an agenda which I think in some ways is a lot more honest than trying to make an agenda where there is none. And so we're almost at the end and here's the coda. Most of this work has been mostly um, abstract. 
knit, crochet stuff. But I have to tell you, I want to leave you with a few ideas about um, this relationship between abstraction and representation and um, some other kind of juicier ideas about ritual and homage. And so this is the public view in, in, in Las Vegas. The question is, what happens when you bring a big vagina to Las Vegas? The answer is, it's way too fuzzy for these guys, and you hear every feminist story that any woman ever wanted to tell you. It's like hysterical. I was like, oh, but you guys are sex positive. It's like, yeah, not like that. It would have to be completely shaved and totally not made out of like yarn, okay? You got the wrong audience. Um, there are times when showing up and representing with something extremely populist is the point. Um, why make a vaginal doorway? with hand-woven doormat and call it Mr. Slit. It's because I want to talk across generations to these young dykes and queers um, about the experience of a shared location. Uh, everybody who walked through there kind of got their version, either backwards or forwards, of their relationship to that portal. It's supposed to be funny. Um, or why bother in a small Italian village to like make this total like blue mantle of the virgin around these little bloomers <laughs> that were made in the 19th century or that the, at the local bar. Um, it's like to celebrate, like this is totally ham-fisted goofiness of celebrating in a totally uh, Catholic way because you're seeing all these frescoes on the street of the virgin um, of something so, um, so much not talked about, really, in Italy um, uh, about sex, gender, sexuality in a particular kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's way too funny, it's way too ham-fisted, and, um, you know, my imagined Festival of the Mother was enjoyed by the public, but not in, a, in that kind of really um, brainiac kind of way that, that I, I aspire to in a way. So it's a little bit uh, poking at my own um, desire to be taken seriously. And so um, the, the point I'm making here is that I emphatically embrace um, the cultures that I come from. Um, I feel like a lot of my work is to, to fight back any notion, given notion of what I should be talking about as an, uh, uh, as an artist or to be um, you know, being told when I should stop doing um, these kinds of exhibitions because it's not on the appropriate track for me as a, this kind of artist or um, you know, to talk about the Second Vatican Council as a in, in American architecture and interior design as a truly legitimate um, art world location, I think is really a lot of what I think about right now, which is ridiculous, right? So it's as much, um, you know, me saying, I just love this stuff for better or worse, I'm just gonna keep working it as long as I possibly can. And, and then to you to say, don't neglect the things you've always loved even if they're ridiculous, even if they're stupid, even if they do not um, comply with the current New York art season that's right about to open, right? Because if the stuff is already out there, it's already done. The languages that we work with, as, var as various as they are, are pretty much set. Mess with it, man. Mess with it so that you are immediately ineligible to play. Mess with it so that people are beguiled, confused, and must follow you to figure out what the next sentence is. That's what we need. And I'm like really, I'm always hot for that kind of um, engagement. So we're kind of long. But I love questions, so bring it on.
I know. And you can, let's start just with anything. Here's, here's one. Do you have a preferred material that you work with now? I, um, for the past few projects, um, I've been having fun just like shopping on, I shop online a lot, um, mostly because the places that I used to go don't exist anymore. And that's been kind of my life, like I was a big Woolworths person and then it went away, and then I was, you know, like, then I had to, I would only use, oh, oh, I got to do it over here. Okay, so I, I like the shopping. I like the shopping because, um, mostly because I like the vendors. Like, I have a couple of suppliers, like, I have this company um, called Soul Choice that I get all my shoelace material from, and I've been working with them for, like, It's amazing. I've been working with them since 99 or 2000. And when they, I first worked with them, they were called Mitchell Lace, and then they went bankrupt. And I was like, where am I going to go now? And then a couple of years, then I started working with rubber bands and rubber and yarn. And then they came back. And it's one of these success stories. Like, they went bankrupt, and the employees uh, bought the business, and so the same crew that I used to do orders with are running the show. So it's like, yay! Um, they're a different place, and I can get less variety from them because I think they're not making their own braid. Obviously, they're not making their own braid anymore, but um, maybe some of it. But they they still have a business in a pretty um, kind of bereft part of Ohio. So. The, the, you know, I am a child of the end of the industrial age, so my consciousness of New York and of New York as a site of art is very much tied to um, the industrial era of, of um, uh, the machine made, of, and of Duchampian stories about, you know, like, he loved our plumbing. Like, this is another era and perhaps shouldn't be, uh, so fetishized, but so I like that. I also have, I'm moving my studio like this next week to uh, the Sharp Luentis studios. And so I'm noticing um, my studio has basically been in boxes for the last six years. And I figured out a way to work at home so that I knit and crochet, box it, and then make it big. Um, and there's a politics of space around that that I think is really interesting. But I have boxes of junk that I've been carrying around for like 30 years. And there's a, um, I think of it as my Tony Fair box, because once I met Tony and his work, I was like, oh yeah, okay, you got it all over me. Like the stuff that is detritus that's also somehow magic. Um, I'm up for anything, but I am, I am somebody that has hand saws in her studio. Like if I need to cut something, I clamp it and go like this, this kind of action. Especially for stretchers, get a miter box or get an angle. It's not that much wood, you know? Panels, I don't know, that's another story. But and that's like the long, I'm gonna give everybody the long answer, it's just how I am. So yeah. I was just curious, what's your connection? Um, like, you, there's a lot of strong autobiography aspect to a lot of things. What is the connection to um, crochet? I met my mother taught me how to crochet. I mean, uh, when I was making the doppelgangers, everything like if you go through all of the um, all of the uh, yeah, let's just shut that down. All of the um, Everything's got like, maybe it's got a little crochet or a piece of fabric I found, and then it's like knotted in or tied in or sewed in to a piece of plastic. And uh, then I started crocheting these blue things and because they looked like the photogram projection fields, and I was calling them projection fields. So I was trying to, you can see I have this habit of like pulling things apart 
and then trying them out and then pulling them apart again and then making new little um, areas of, it's like a kitchen, right? This is happening over here. So I'm always making little objects. I have always made little objects. And uh, so there was this moment when I was like, Leah Gunchitana was working at the old thread waxing space and she said, do you want to do the show? And it was like, the first time I just crocheted to make all the shadows and the, the pictures were getting very easy to draw. Like I could look at a shadow and be like, I got it, 10 different pictures, which one do you want? So I started directing a narrative and, uh, and we called it Josephine because Josephine taught me how to crochet and the pictures were supposed to be about Josephine, my mother. Um, and I think that was because I moved home from Boston. Like I was just back. Um, but also because it was, uh, it was a little bit like in your face work. Um, yeah, I, I like all kinds of ways of making things. Um, but I, I like to keep it messy, like open-ended. And uh, like how messy, where that continuum is, all has meaning. So I'm better now. So I had to learn how to knit again. So I'm not that good at that. There's another. Uh, could you maybe talk a, a bit more about the, the spaces to look at paintings you mentioned? How did you? So can you say that a little louder? Could you please talk more about the places to, or the spaces to look at paintings you mentioned during your? Sure. Um, I, I have to say that um, as much as I like to name things, I also don't like the way other people name things. So for a long time, I wouldn't use the word installation art because it was like, oh my God, you got to name it as a thing and now we're going to turn this into a thing and then it's going to be, it's going to get codified and locked in and seal you. So um, I hate the term social sculpture. It's like I don't know of a kind of sculpture that isn't social. Um, and the kind of sculpture that we mostly talk about as objects, um, or installations, have really deep roots in the history of things made three-dimensionally. but the notion of this big umbrella called the discipline called sculpture that includes all these other subsets, that's not very old. I mean, that's like maybe 100 years old. It's really the beginning, the late 19th, beginning of the 20th century where you've got a lot of leaky stuff where the painters are making, like Picasso's making a little absinthe glass and it's like, ooh, what's that? Like where you get people, um, Re referring to things other than the city square or something attached to a building or um, either the, the state or the church, right? That's the only place you'd ever find sculpture, the state or the church. It's also kind of the only place you'd find painting until those damn Dutch got, you know, bougie on us and took it off the, you know, so, so this idea of like, that's a ceramic sculpture and that's metal and that's this kind of sculpture and there's this weird forms that are coming out of where they're coming from. That's pretty um, new and if you took that blip out of the equation before the 20th century, all sculpture was social sculpture. It was either a tool, <laughs> uh, what we call decorative arts like I drink out of the sculpture, or um, attached to a building, or like Marcus Aurelius sitting in a square, you know? It had all these different functions, taking space and being objects. So um, I understand, uh, I think sculpture is a funny thing because when it feels like there's a moment when painting might be back or, you know, like, prominent again, it's like, well, it's never gonna go away, okay? We've got a couple of thousand years. 
where's it going to go? You know, um, pictures. It's it comes up with new words to describe how it does its thing. I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of happy uh, that it's there's so many morphing zones and space and objects and where all the lines are to refer to like this thing and this stuff and this and then the institution and it's very powerful. Uh, you screw a wall in that wall of a museum. It's social. It's political. It's everything. It's intense. But we that requires, I think, a kind of connoisseurship that's also complicated. Be, be able to look very finely at every tiny decision made, and uh, and I think that's very important. Uh, uh, even though it might be impossible for some media, which is also very important to that to those media. So I don't even know what you asked, but I think I answered it. Right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Could you tell me about um, the process when you choose the material? So I see the rubber bands. Like you use the rubber bands, which is black. But I saw the um, changes, like some colors added and things like that. Yeah. When I first started out with like the, the lap piece that went around, I really only thought of these things as drawings in space, really. I mean, I knew, I knew all of the sculptural, I mean, I was trained as a sculptor. So I, I think about everything like a sculptor. But I, if I had one location to call my location, it would be drawing, because I'm not that invested in certain levels of pre-thought or prior thought and planning or, um, or craft to really be a sculptor. I'm kind of like a fake sculptor. But drawing, I could go anywhere. Like, drawing's everything, it's nothing, it's weird. It's the ultimate shapeshifter. And it's really old and really economical. Um, so I saw it only black and white, only black, white, and gray, only black, white, beige, and gray. Um, and then I started to add color, and then it was like, whoa, maybe I can make a painting. One color, it's a painting. Like, thresholds of meaning, you know, like it's a joke because it's neither painting by material, maybe it's painting optically. And most painters would say there are no real color relationships there, or I would even say in a crit. It's mostly drawing with color filled in, right? But this um, constant pursuit of painting as the center of the universe, which for my art world, it just is. It's like being born Catholic. I'm never not going to be culturally Catholic. I'm never not going to see painting as the center of the art world's universe, just because of how I've been taught and what, where, where I stick my, you know, tent posts. Um, what did you ask me? Material choice. So sometimes it's physical, like. Whoa, like, oh, this is good. Um, it moves. I made some, I made a, a couple of, um, the first time I used the rubber bands was the, in that, at Wesleyan and that really big piece. And one of the best things about that piece was that it was right from the factory and it was real rubber. And so that enormous space with these very slight drawings in the space, it smelled like rubber, like crazy rubber. So there was this infiltration of this very kind of high modernist space with this like stinky rubber and very, I would say, fey sort of loopy little drawings, like not, not much like a, like a Bryce Martin wannabe failed bad news, you know? Um, yeah, it's a, it, they're a combination of things that I'm trying to do. Some of it haptic feeling, some of it like architectural, like I want to make a tent, or um, some of it because of association. Uh, 
like the shoelace thing was saying, okay, Granddad had the shoe repair shop, so let's balance this out, you know. And then just realizing that I had a ton of shoelaces around for whatever reason, I like tying things together in my junk boxes. So it was just a, a lot of stuff came out of those junk boxes and then turned away or chosen for, rejected or included for the possibilities of meaning. Um, but most of the decisions I make are, are a kind of position in relationship to work I've just made to teach myself something or in relationship to the language of the exhibition or a, a kind of a curatorial, something I see going on curatorially, just to bend the meaning left or right out of, off of center. Not a lot, just a little tweak. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, you talk about, at the end, like authenticity of making what comes basically from within you, I would say. Am I summarizing that properly? I, I, would, I wouldn't use the word authenticity. Mostly because, you know, the, I have to, through big, you know, I like to make confessions, it's my upbringing, but um, in the last year and a half, most of what I've, books I've listened to or lectures I've listened to are all about like world history or linguistics. They really haven't been not much about art. And what I've realized is how Puritan we are. We're not only like white, we're really Puritan, especially if you're in the Northeast. And so the should, shouldn't thing is a major American problem. It's like, so authentic, it's like, it still holds this like finger wagging thing that, put, that creeps me out. And what I'm asking for is self-knowledge and knowledge of your culture. Self-knowledge is, I think it's one part of the artist's job. No self-knowledge, um, and I don't mean like romantic, painful, you could have had a completely happy childhood and everything could have been, you know, like just self-knowledge, like where are you from? What are the, do the connoisseurship read on like, what did you have for breakfast? Why do you think you had that for breakfast every, you know, like try to unpack patterns of, of um, cultural habits, productivity, objects, tendencies. Um, that's where the work comes from, those specifics. And they could look like nothing but that's the risk of choosing the nothing and following that, that nothing. You might get in a critique that it is not read, it is not legible to anybody, right? So then you move further out to the edge of wherever, some kind of common ground. But um, I don't think work made in any other way is sustainable. Because you, fro you know, like you make work to pitch into an environment of what is going on. Everybody leaps into their moment of like, oh, this is going on, and that. And then once that moment goes somewhere, you've got to decide where you want to go with your work, and you have to be, you have to be able to sustain yourself, and not just sustain yourself in the context of what's going on, but what in in the context of what's resonant to you. So within that context for yourself and those risks that you've taken, have you been met with um, either major acceptance or major turn down? In, in the beginning, it was like when I was in art school, those doppelgangers, who were, this was the way it went. Get rid of the drawing. Get rid of the object. Get rid of the drawing. Get rid of the object. And about three people who are my friends were like, yeah, we get it, Sheila. Just keep it the way it is. And I was just stubborn. It was like, no, they, do, they don't exist without each other. There's nothing there without each other. So, you know, <laughs> I'm like, uh, when I first started crocheting, I got like a lot of deadpan, like, this is where you're gonna go? And then, thank God, a few, five years later, I mean, I got gigs out 
in the, in the world. But it was also that there were all these young people knitting and crocheting after 9-11. Like, who knew? This whole maker thing happened. And they found me. And if it hadn't been for that intergenerational thing, I'd still be like, <laughs> you know, hi. Like, I didn't know that I was speaking to, I didn't know I had an audience that I had. And, uh, and I was fortunate in that way that there were people that were getting what I was trying to do. And men and women who were owning the, the activity um, in a great variety of things. Um, and, and I've been asked if I would be considered a fiber artist, and I'm like, sure. But I don't know much about fiber. Like, I know a lot about ceramics. It's all in my dinosaur brain, because I was really young when I learned it. But um, I'm better at making the fiber stuff than I am the clay stuff. Right? No. Yeah, what I'm, what I'm asking for is um, is not living in high school, I think. You know? Yeah. You know what that means, right? Yeah. yeah okay. on Second Vatican Council architecture in the United States, um, but I won't subject you to that. Um, just know that I went to Mass every Saturday or every Sunday until the age of 17, which in New Jersey is the driving age at which time you can say, oh yeah, Ma, I went to Mass, um, and go to the diner, which is also a New Jersey phenomenon, and drink coffee and smoke cigarettes all morning long. Um, I grew up in a family business, which actually, for those of the students that I might be working with, you should know that I have a very um, uh, pretty intense work ethic issue. Um, I, I like work. I, uh, I like to do things that involve work and involve work that is, as you will see, ephemeral in some way. I think um, the quality of the labor has, uh, could mean many things, many different things in, the, in terms of the quality of the output, uh, the, as, as we say, the outcomes now of our labor. Um, some of the cultural events from my childhood included going to the um, World's Fair when I was a child. I um, do vaguely remember seeing the Pieta, but I mostly remember hiding my face in my mother's skirt as we rode along the moving sidewalk, my first time on a moving sidewalk, and that it was dark. And he goes like, beauty, the Pieta was beauty lit. What I now, in retrospect, find interesting is all of, at the World's Fair, which doesn't really exist anymore, there are pavilions from every country around the world. My parents decided to go to the Vatican's pavilion. So that's their idea of like the foreign country they wanted to visit first. Like, it, it's a good indication of at the, uh, at the uh, Pistoletto Foundation and have somebody stare at me very intently and say in Italian, where are you from? Which I don't understand, or I do now, but I, wouldn't, I didn't then, and realize that he has recognized something in my features that another Italian would recognize as a regional um, look. Um, then I look into his eyes and realize Oh, he has that ba weird baggy thing under his eyes too. He's probably from the South as well. So there's a strange thing that is both genetic and cultural that I think is kind of fascinating. And for all of us that are doing DNA, DNA tests now, there's some, <laughs> some search for further verification of, of um, some kind of sense of identity. The thing that I love about this uh, photograph is that I, and probably somebody else, can tell that uh, Grandma Rose, who's in the middle, um, is flanked by her two daughters, Annie, to her right, who lives in New Jersey all year long, and um, 
No, Mary, to her right, who lives in New Jersey or lived in New Jersey all year long, and um, Annie, to her left, who lived in Florida all year long. And from the shoe equation, you can tell that Grandma Rose spent half the year in New Jersey and the other half the year in Florida. I um, was brought up in a very Italian, uh, uh, I'm second generation Southern Italian American, way liberal um, Roman Catholic church. This was one of the um, stained glass windows in my church. It was like a really big deal. It was a second Vatican Council design church. We could have a whole lex. Uh, about 19, before 1959, which is the, the uh, year that I was born. And, um, you know, I'm going to tell you a lot of autobiographical information, but I want to underscore the fact that I'm reading this stuff for the cultural artifacts and um, uh, kind of cultural archive of pieces of things that they wore, that, uh, that I might have seen as a child. Uh, I know those shoes from my grandmother. I used to like play around them. So the, the autobiographical pieces are not really meant to be um, incredibly uh, subjective. Rather, they are the things that I can find in a culture outside of my own individual experience that you may depending on how old you are, or how much Nick at Night you've watched, or where you go on the internet, um, you may or may not have known. But uh, you'll see that they are generational, um, uh, a kind of intergenerational factoids, and they, they are pieces of culture that, that remain resonant for me. So um, you know, the interesting thing about this photograph, apart from the baggy suits, um, is the family resemblance. I mean, apart from uh, the suits and the clothing and the shoes, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute, um, there is ultimately that thing that happens to a person when they recognize a real um, genetic feature right, of, of their own that they can identify as uh, a regional part of Italy, like being in Piemonte and having somebody at the, the size of the world that I lived in. Happily, I grew up in North Jersey, which meant that um, in the 60s and mostly in the 70s, we were taken as school children on buses into New York to go to the major museums, to go to rehearsals of, um, of uh, the Metropolitan Opera, so we went to MoMA, the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Opera House. I saw Peter, I heard and saw Peter and the Wolf conducted by Bernstein. As a child, there were a lot of screaming children. When we went to the Metropolitan Opera, we were in the family circle where the nosebleeds were, but we didn't really care because I thought the coolest thing was, was they showed you the changing of the sets with, like in full light during that happened. So you kind of got a sense of, art being made. Um, this uh, Guernica was one of my favorite early things to see, partly because there was um, a game I would play with the guards, which was how close could you get to Guernica without getting in trouble, um, which was pretty close. But um, in a very uh, visceral way, I sort of understood that they was, these were kind of like big cartoons um, and people were upset. That's what I got. I didn't know what Guernica was. Guernica was the name of a painting. That was it. Um, I love and loved and have loved TV. I think every generation has uh, its, uh, its medium. Many, for many of you, the medium is, um, is the web, is the internet, is whatever, email, everything that pertains to that. My mother's generation, it was the radio. The radio would be on all of the time.
Good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure to, wel <laughs> to welcome Sheila Pepe, a cross-disciplinary artist who's best known for her large-scale installations and sculptures that address issues of feminism and class. Sheila has exhibited extensively in the US and abroad. A few of her many solo exhibitions have been shown uh, at venues such as Smith College Museum of Art in Northampton, Massachusetts, the Weatherspoon, Weatherspoon Art Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, and the Istanbul International Arts Fair in Turkey. Her work has been part of such important group shows as Hand Made, the performative impulse in art and craft, shown at the Contemporary Art Museum Houston in Texas, and Artisterium in Tbilisi, Georgia, and the very first Greater New York show at uh, PS1 MoMA in 2000. Sheila has received awards and held residencies at organizations such as the Joan Mitchell Center and the Lower East Side Print Shop, among many others. Sheila received a BFA from uh, Mass Art in 1983 and an MFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, also known as the Museum School, in 1995. She's been an educator at Brandeis University, Bard, RISD, VCU, Williams, Skowhegan, and was assistant chair of fine arts at Pratt until recently. We are so happy to now have Sheila on faculty with us here at SVA. Please join me in welcoming Sheila Pepe. Thank you. Hello. So it's a pleasure to be here and to start off the new year with all of you. And here we go. So uh, these are the peppies.